No one wanted Space Marine 2 to be good more than me. After falling head over heels in love with the Warhammer tabletop game during COVID, I've become an avid enthusiast, collector, and player, often bringing up the universe, its canon, the game itself, and the concept of painting little toy soldiers to anyone who will listen to me. And part of this fascination is also trying to find the extended media to enjoy that brings this exciting world to life. Some are better than others, with video games like Mechanicus and Chaos Gate being standouts in their respective genres, and finding some enjoyment in the more middling affairs like Dark Tide and Hired Gun. But Space Marine 2, much like Dawn of War comes with some legacy and a pedigree of older nerds saying, yeah, the game slapped the first time around. I guess I went into like Dark Tide and Hired Gun with much lower expectations than in Space Marine, and that's part of the problems I'm having with. Much like Dawn of War 3, Space Marine 2 fails to really live up to the nostalgia and the hype in my opinion, although it's a more polished game for the most part than Dawn of War 3, and also largely more faithful to the source material and the original game, perhaps to a fault. The following review is going to be littered with a lot of spoilers, you've been warned. Space Marine 2 picks up 100 years or so after the first title, and we're thrown back into the shoes of Dimitri and Titus, or Captain Titus as we last knew him, playing as him in his last mission as a Death Watch Black Shield, which throws some love to an Hello. often not acknowledged faction. This opening, showing me some firstborn marines and a faction like the Death Watch, at first I wasn't even sure if it was going to be Titus until I saw the chains, but this filled me with excitement that the game might be touching upon and showing me things that I just didn't think that GW you cared about or dent to show in their flagship video game. Unfortunately, the opening mission is the only mission that made me feel that way. And as we went on and on, I realized I wasn't going to get to see much beyond the poster boy normal stuff. After a mortal injury during the opening scenes of the game, which might be some of the coolest bits of action we will see throughout the game, unfortunately, Titus undergoes the primarisification procedure, I'm not sure on the exact name, going across the river Rubicon or whatever, to save him from the mortal stab wound for the chest that he received from a Carnifex. Marines really are double hard bastards. And that leads us into the bulk of Space Marine 2, a strongly primaris pilled by the numbers hack and shooter that feels like he was dug up out of the grave of a game from 2011. And that's both a blessing, to some extent, but a huge, huge curse. Honestly, it felt like I was playing a retro reboot or a reskin of a classic video game, something that I do a lot at the moment, by the way. I, I rarely buy into the new hype, and I'm often finding myself playing HD remasters of the classics and things that I liked from years gone by. The combat feels like it was picked up and transplanted right from the original Space Marine game, although it's missing the bullet time, slow down time thing that you had, even going as far as to feel a little repetitive and lacking in depth, but in the same way that I got that feeling from Space Marine 1 when I returned to replay it last year. The basic gameplay loop is, for the most part fun when you get to grips with it it can be very satisfying too when you start to like achieve small combos with the jump packs and stuff although the co controls for that thing are very clunky in essence you always have two ranged weapons and a close combat weapon equipped most guns even the plasma rifles kind of suck complete shit so you will always be needing to wade into combat to kill hordes and hordes of enemies with your melee weapon you shoot and reload like in a conventional shooter but cover is largely unnecessary or borderline useless with your armor or shields recharging after quite a long wait out of combat so hiding behind a corner doesn't usually get you the desired result of refilling your health bar like in other shooters that take homage from things like Halo. Instead, armor is replenished by certain actions in melee, successfully firing off a signposted close quarters pistol shot for a boost in damage to the enemy that you are shooting will recharge a pip of your armor. Or more commonly and most useful is the execution of a staggered enemy, replenishing all white bar health that you lost from recent hits and replenishing multiple pips of armor as well. You're also invulnerable during the execution animation, giving you a way to dodge incoming missile attacks by entering the execute to give a bit of a, a skill ceiling that you can appro approach with that and uh, allows you to look around and plan your next melee attack as well. Unfortunately, as good and clean as the transitions between the dramatically gory animations are, they will absolutely begin to feel a little bit stale towards the end of the game's rather short runtime, with some enemies like the Chaos Sorcerer only having one execution animation that I must have seen around six times over the course of the final hour of the game. It feels really weird approaching enemies from a different angle with a different weapon equipped uh, just to see the same head pulling animation. And there's a lot of head pulling. I found it really funny, like almost comical, that outside of skewering the sorcerer and smashing people with a hammer, it feels like Titus is particularly adept at ripping the heads off of sealed power armor, which must be quite difficult if I'm honest. Sure, it looks kind of brutal and dramatic, but it gets so weird over time that he's just doing this to every marine he comes across. This can be the most effective way to kill a space marine in power armor, but maybe he just got into bad habits with the zone thropes, the singular neuron throp, the carnifexes, and tyrannid warriors that all involve him ripping their heads off for the most part. It's normally a bladed limb to the mouth or a head being ripped off. 
There's not much variety there. I don't believe there's a single execution animation that involves him shooting them at close combat with a pistol, which I just seems like the obvious one to go to if I was brainstorming options for the animation team to put into the game. Beyond the execution and health system, the other key mechanic is dodging or parrying. An orange icon comes up when you need to physically dodge with the space bar on PC to roll out of the way of an incoming attack, whilst a whitish blue hued one is when you can block with your melee weapon to create an opening to get a counter attack in. And that is the ins and outs of the combat in a nutshell, there isn't really much more to it. There are a handful of melee weapons to choose from over the course of the game, all of them with some basic combos of heavy and light attacks or dash and charged up attacks. And that's where it kind of has that God of War thing that some people re reference. I think it's unfair to reference God of War because it's nowhere near as deep or tense or interesting as the most recent God of War games. And if we look back at like God of War uh, 1 through 3, classic hack and slash games, or, beat em, or, or I guess, yeah, hack and slash games, those games have a lot more intricacy and um, details in terms of what things you can unlock and combos you can do, where Space Spring 2, uh, much like its predecessor, has a very basic list of combos you can approach. Among the weapons, weirdly, the iconic Power Fist is only available in co-op and multiplayer, meaning the weapons on offer for Melee are a little slimmer, only four options, the Power Sword, the Combat Knife, the Chainsaw, and the Thunder Hammer. It, it kind of rings true for the whole game, that seems like a lot of content was cut from the main storyline and the solo game to be added to the co-op and the PvP. My biggest issues are with the solo game, because it was a bit that I was excited for. I've been wanting a good solo Warhammer game for a long time. I didn't get it here. Almost 10 guns, but seven to eight of them are various forms of bolt rifle that, in the thick of combat, largely feel the same. Slightly different fire rates, spread, damage, recoil. But a bolt carbine and a bolt rifle aren't heavily, much dissimilar to a heavy bolt rifle in many ways. But it's a little bit unfair as they're obviously different, but to be honest, they don't feel that different. That's the important bit, like how they feel. And the bolt sniper is less of a bolt gun. It's 12 shots, single shots. That's probably quite distinct to the others. And then you've got one plasma gun, one plasma pistol, uh, you've got a melter gun and a heavy melt that you can pick up and a, and a las fuel fusel as well um so there's not that many non-bolt gun options they're all the um primarified stuff the melter rifle the Yaz las fusel the plasma incinerator there's no missile launcher there's no grav cannon there's no shotgun no las cannon if we get into like weird esoteric heresy stuff, there's no rotary cannon, onslaught gatling cannons of any kind, volkites, just a load of options left on the cutting room floor that it didn't engage with for whatever reason, with a volkite pistol being weirdly on the roadmap uh, to be added as content, a baffling addition so late in the game's life cycle that doesn't really wet my purse with excitement. Ultimately, the combat feels by and large fun. It's very much a power fantasy of big strong marine man mows down hordes and hordes and hordes of enemies, and I mean hordes of enemies. There are times that there are nearly a hundred Tyranids on screen at once, and the game's bait and switch villains of the Thousand Sons also bring with them cultists, traitors, and zangors, which are like chaos beast men, I meaning they also have hordes of minions that rush into your big cleaving chainsaw blades, and all the enemies feel very, very dumb. Problem is, outside of boss encounters, this all gets pretty stale too. Even the smarter enemies like Tyranid Warriors, Rubik Marines, or the Occult Terminators are arguably the cultists, because they are humans with guns after all. They seem to all be as thick as pig shit, just standing around shooting you and occasionally stepping sideways or teleporting in the case of the Rubik Marines if you shoot at them too much, but a lot of them will just stand there, absorb bullets and die. Not a single enemy in the game will take cover, they do not flank you, the only advanced tactics employed by them is seemingly standing still and shooting you whilst a load of other shit gets in the way, the cannon fodder is kind of like a protective wall because you gotta chew through it with your chainsaw. And this feels kind of stupid, I know this is kind of how the old game played, largely in part because you were fighting orcs for the first two to three hours, right? Which had a lot more personality too, that's another problem, I don't think any of the enemies have personalities in this game barring one sorcerer and the lead villain kind of has, but he gets a bit boring too. It's all rather stupid. Tyranid warriors are meant to be smart with Titus even having a line about not underestimating the intelligence of the Tyranid horde and then you watch them just step left to right getting shot the shit out of and they feel pretty dumb. Rubrics are even more baffling. The exact level of sentience of a Rubik marine seems to vary by author and source but these guys being ancient veterans of the long war and then employing zero actual strategy is just so fucking funny. They just plod towards you waiting for you to rip their heads off. All is dust I guess, even the battle plans. There are some nice details some Amongst the fights, killing synaptic linked tyranids like the, the synaptic uh, waypoint monsters, like warriors, for example, will sometimes shock, stun, and often kill smaller nids nearby which is pretty good. It gives you like a, an angle of attack as well and some strategy to employ in killing the big stuff. And it also fits like canonically and with the tabletop game. And Rubik's are made of nothing but rainbow dust. 
all his dust. So when you go on a head ripping spree, as Titus often does, it just pours out of them like candy and sherbet falling out of a hole. But all of that said, the enemy variety is really lacking. Tyranid's got a range refresh at the beginning of this edition of Warhammer, and they have over 50 different data sheets in their book. In this game, we get Hormagonts, which are the mealy little grubs, Termagonts with the little grubs of guns, Spore Mines, Zone Thropes, Ripper Swarms, kinda, Gargoyles, Warriors with different weapons, like three different weapon loadouts. And beyond that, we have boss encounters that become sub bosses with a Lictor, a Carnifex, and a Neuranthrope. There's no Gene Stealers, there's no Exocrines, there's no Swarm Lord. I haven't played all the co op missions, maybe he's stuck in there for some bizarre reason. The Norn Emissary, the big new Kaiju monster, missing. No Hive Guard, no Tyrant Guard, no Von Ryan's Leapers. I think I saw like a shadow of one at one point, but it might have just been a Lictor. It's bizarre how little has actually made it into the game out of the range. We literally only see one big bug and we don't see any of the really big bugs none of the like the harpies or the hierophants or anything and they're not just a, they're not avoiding um, forge world stuff by the way necrons are hinted at as we go into a tomb world towards the end of the game and all we see are dead forge world like uh, the centipede units which is so strange there's not a single necron fight in the entire game after going to a tomb world it feels like it was always like a thing they wanted to do and maybe it got cut maybe that's dlc if the dlc comes out and it's a fight against necrons because the game is left quite open-ended then i'm pretty sure it was cut content in the single player and it feels like a lot of the single player content was cut from the sidelines to make a third game mode with the operations missions which are co-op missions that fill out the background goings on behind the scenes of the solo playing and it makes the world feel a little bit more well realized to an extent because you have other missions happening in the background which you can also play in the co-op however it fucks the pacing of the main game there is a hive tyrant in the co-op which are side missions for the main story but if you are just playing central's titus story the hive tyrant dies off screen rather undramatically it does save you from like a triple carnifex battle in the nick of time but it still feels really weird and besides that titular hive tyrant dying off screen every solo mission from titus has the section where before you get to your thunderhawk or go on your mission he has to stop in chapter three nondescript marines and gravis mark 10 and phobos armor stand-ins for the customizable co-op characters and frankly i hated these stop and chats I like the idea of explaining why Titus only ever has the two men with him, because the other half of the squad are off doing something, and it's much better than the captain constantly saying we can only spare three men, or we can only spare six men, which he will do constantly throughout the game, by the way. Like, it's really funny when you're doing, like, the most important task for the war, the one last ditch effort to swing the sway of the battle for the planet, and the captain of the ship will be like, we can only spare three men, Titus. You're super important, but we can only spare three men. I roll my fucking eyes every single goddamn time. But there is a more common thread of having to listen to Titus engage with very boring dialogue with his not only the the guys that are going off on a side mission but the captain there's often just a cutscene where they talk about how the mechanics are bad or there's bad guys in this building that you need to go to and then it largely serves nothing other than just telling you your mission objective which gets told you on the loading screen anyway his squad mates or, or random people disappearing off screen for those co-op missions the squad mate stuff is really frustrating because you'll get into a lift and they will just argue like little children people just accusing Titus of being a chaos guy like it's, it's, it's a callback to the original one uh, in the virtual space where we had um oh what's his name it was it was one of the squad members who was suspect of titus going off codex i get that it's a reference to that but it's really tiring to hear it like every single elevated conversation for the first like three or four hours of the game it does have a payoff later down the line probably the only like growth and change of characters throughout the whole thing but it's still rather uninteresting if i'm honest there is no gravitas to any of the proceedings in terms of these conversations because people are just voice acting whilst you sit or walk inside a hidden load screen down a corridor. And a lot of time the information is useless and not interesting. There's a moment where a character gets upset, if only briefly, because their battle brother fell to the nids. And he says that he wouldn't have died to a Hormagon. And Titus explains there's more than Gaunts out there, which is setting up the next mission where you have a Lictor encounter. But and this is fine, but it's a blink and you'll miss it moment that slows the game down uh, as you walk through an environment listening to a convo that you don't really care too much about and it's kind of funny because there isn't that much more than gaunts out there it's setting up like i thought we can get all sorts of gribblings over the course of the game we just didn't and these conversations feel a bit like a uh, breaking the show don't tell rule i'm just getting told about stuff as opposed to being shown it in an interesting way which most of the cutscenes in the game are just people talking to each other with maybe three of them showing actual battles or people doing cool stuff 
It's weird. The pacing's really off. And part of me wondered if this was a setup for the character to come back later in a Dreadnought because they've been mortally injured uh, to get his redemptive only in death does duty end moment, but that just doesn't happen. Two different squad mates die, one on screen and one off, and neither get the dread treatment. But we do get a four minute here's a redemptive Dreadnought fighting alongside you moment towards the end of the game where they could have had a callback to add a small amount of emotional anchor or some, some just a callback to make the world feel cohesive, I guess. And they just decided not to and it's a really odd mission hell it's kind of just like a big robot does some shooting on one feet of strength and then we move on it's cool to see a primaris redemptor one of my favorite models in the line walking around and shooting and shit and it kills a hellboot in a really dramatic way but the rage inducing existence of an eternally damned to war existence like it's never touched upon or even hinted at there's just no depth to the proceedings here it's just a shallow surface level look at robot do a shoot and that's kind of how space Marine 2 feels largely on the whole it's just shallow in many ways i was clambering for more set pieces if you're going to do shallow um fan service give me all the fan service there are a few bits previously mentioned there's a lictor encounter it's built up in a to be a big thing over the course of the mission and it's like the boss of the mission but it ends up being a bullet sponge that you have to dodge attacks from and wait to come out of camo to shoot at okay sure i guess and there are a few moments where you have to save machinery from swarms of gargoyles that rest on the chains or the pipes and chew on them and you burn your way through a carpet of ripper swarms at one point which is kind of cool but it goes on for a bit too long there's a hint that cooler set pieces involved with like fighting a, a threat that's very different to a humanoid foe with the tyranid swarm and i think they hint at something a lot cooler that we never really end up getting it's so close yet so far and it's also weird because the co-op and the pvp which show a lot more promise than the solo game have leveling up they have progression they have unlocks that are like skill trees or feats or perks and stuff and all of that is absent from the solo game which is fine i'm, I'm playing an action adventure i don't need to level stuff up and upgrade stuff in some ways it's got a retro sensibility in not having that but then that would lend itself to let's just do weird gimmick stuff right because then we can not have to care about improving our character's stats or picking abilities or whatever i mean just do different stuff we can be a redemptor dreadnought at one point we can be a tank at one point like it just has to be titus either why are we tied to only playing as titus and nothing else but instead we're hard locked into titus as a character and thus we never get a turret section we never get a tank section we never get a redemptor dreadnought section and usually these kinds of things would make my me roll my eyes like the vehicle sections in call of duty games but like it's this kind of thing that i want to see in a 40k game i want to see different parts of the game realize in a way that fleshes out the game beyond what is largely happening in static plastic novels and in my head for instance we see people mounting and dismounting thunderhawks a little bit too much it's a canned hidden load screen thing we see the ship flying off coming back people getting on and off and uh, like sure but give me other stuff at one point the ship gets shot or damaged on the way into entry and they have an emergency landing and we almost get a cool moment when they grav lock their boots to the floor but then the cutscene awkwardly cuts to them just jumping off the ship and the grav locking of the boots and the damage to the thunderhawk meant nothing it had no stakes and didn't do anything to the game why was the ship even damaged if it does nothing to the gameplay nor the story it's really dumb another moment like this a repulsor flies up to them a hover tank the expensive 70 pound tank model sat on my shelf that i love i'm desperately wanting to see them it realize in the flesh to see it shoot to see it move how does it hover how does it um, maneuver between terrain pieces how does a marine get on and off of it how does the, the the gunner get in and out of it the marine on top asks if they want to ride and they say yes and i was like oh fuck here we go i sit up in my seat and then the cutscene awkward Really cuts to them walking away from the tank at the end destination we don't see them mount in get in or do anything engaging with the tank it's so shallow i feel robbed of a moment that i was looking forward to i mean seeing them mount the tank is the very least ambitious bit i would love to see them uh, play as driving the tank down some streets shooting sections where you're just mounting the turret or something where you have to kill fast moving tyrannies as you hang out the back of the hover tanks like um transport bay you know like some gene stealers pursuing us through the streets and bearing in mind gene stealers are completely and utterly absent from the entire game which is a fucking tragedy we get our singular set piece where we must jump out of a ship and use the jump packs to traverse uh, a fall towards a planet or a space rift or something i've actually forget and only played it a few hours ago you get to dodge some debris see screamers fly past which is a creature we don't get to fight we see the hellrake introduced which is a creature we don't get to fight and that's it we've done this cool falling bit that is kind of the stuff i want to see more of. i want to see zero g combat on the outside of ships like we see in the the book where the ultramarines fight the world eaters the the betrayal at Kalth. i want fighting aboard a thunder hawk i want repulses uh, 
Maybe let's be a dreadnought for just five minutes outside of Titus's head so we can gun down some Zangles. It's really funny because like I mentioned Betrayal at Kalf, which is the last heresy book that I read, which is where the ultra is defending into the world he is. And it's, it's referenced in here. There's a lot of name drops to old lore stuff that's meant to, you know, appeal to people like me. And one of the main characters who is surprised that Titus might be between 200 and 400 years old mentions that he was born on Kalf and remembers it well, and that's why he hates chaos. This event happened 10,000 years ago, so it doesn't quite line up or make any fucking sense for the way the character reacted to Titus's age earlier. The reason I bring this up is because it's A, a law inconsistency that bugs me, but B, is in that book at one point when they shoot down ships above the planet, it starts to rain Bane Blades. It starts to rain the largest grade of tank the Imperium has to offer out of the sky, and they're causing like as they land on the reactors go off they're causing huge earthquakes and the, the the motorways are collapsing underneath them and all sorts of stuff we could have had set pieces like that in this big war on this planet but none of those things get realized in the last 13 years since space marine one came around we've had an entire Horus heresy like novel series flesh out all these cool and interesting scenarios that we could see and we don't get to see any of them even the ending stuff with the demons in like the warp and stuff feels it just it feels so typical like we're in a wishy-washy floating rock space in a video game it actually reminds me of some of the bits with um in, in that area where the Emperor lives in Baldur's Gate. There are some upsides. The PvP is legitimately fun, but incredibly bare bones at the moment. There are some fun little slice of life moments. A crew member brushing the floor has gone a little bit memetic online because a man using a wooden broom against the backdrop of the insanity of the 41st millennium is kind of funny. And we also get to see guardsmen executing deserters by firing a squad as we move through an encampment at one point. I mean, to see a tank commander aboard a Bane Blade like stood atop it, um, which we never see during the fight, by the way. But he gives a rousing speech to his Cadians, referencing the destruction of the planet, which is great. We see Marines more than the loss of a brother on the crew decks, tech priest dissecting a dead Carnifex in the armor chamber. There are cool little bits like this that I liked a lot. I just wish there was more of them. And Marnie's Calgar gives a far less rousing and far less exciting speech atop a repulsor in the big end push. And it's way more awkward because it's a pseudo cutscene. Uh, the troops don't seem to be in time with him saying stuff. The chorus of approval seems late. And the sound mixing is fucked too. So when they shout back, like 20 Marines shout like from a crag or whatever, it sounds really quiet, almost as quiet as the hum of the tanks around us. And then when you finally march to battle with a force that looks like 3,000 points of Space Marines like you would in the actual tabletop game, which is what modern technology allows us to do, it's a walking cutscene that ends before anything good happens. You never really get into the fight alongside them. Um, no more than five Marines at once ever appear on screen with you, maybe 10 Cadians. You cull the hordes en masse because they're dumb, but the battles and overall war still manage to feel small because the AI is bad uh, and you don't get to play alongside entire detachments. And the AI is really bad. Cadians are borderline useless on the normal setting and your allies vary wildly sometimes leaving staggered enemies for you to heal off of even though you're at full health and you're more than 10 seconds of sprint away from them across an arena and sometimes they just take them away from you when you need their healing it's very inconsistent the game looks gorgeous textures models effects animations it all feels very high quality with a solid level of polish to it only some weird visual bugs with some armor that i got on my playthrough i was especially enamored by the gorgeous renderings of the high gothic architecture and the grandoise designs especially on the larger hive world where we see it all rendered in bright bright daylight which is a contrast to what we see in other games like Dark Tide and against a skybox of an ongoing war that makes the invading aliens feel like a big threat even if they're not. The game gives you a little too much time to soak in the environments with weirdly long walks between moments where you need to press E to enter the next area. Some might call this breathing room but I found it a little odd and boring. The ambience and atmosphere is also a little lacking. Comparing the game to Dark Tide or Chaos Gate, both games had a more tangible effort going into their experience to feel bespoke. They had unique art styles and atmospheres. Dark Tide for example was darker and heavier with its atmosphere and I thought Space Marine 2 might engage with some of this pseudo horror elements when we get to the flesh eating ripper swarm level or the fighting the aliens in the dark bit but it never really even tries to do these things it never engages with another genre outside of the action uh, adventure game Dark Tide and Mechanicus also spoiled us with their scores which did huge work to elevate the proceedings with incredible soundtracks while Space Marine 2's offerings feel dramatically more understated and subsequently the big dramatic moments like the culmination of the story feel like they fall a little bit flat I was left asking is this it both from a length perspective but also from what i got to do it was my time inside the power armor and that i didn't feel like it was a big enough emotional payoff i just didn't care ultimately the game feels very faithful as a spiritual successor to the og space marine but it's too faithful and it plays so safe that it ends up being a bit boring it's a relic of a game that looks gorgeous but feels like it's 13 years old which isn't what i expected from a full-priced pc release in 2024 the warhammer license carries it heavily with a lot more novel
novelty being, oh look, that's that old model for the Astro Militarum Sentinel, more so than anything really exciting. I also think the art direction is kind of carried by the fact that they've got, you know, 30 years of Warhammer to pull on. I couldn't imagine recommending this game to a non-40k nerd, because it offers very little beyond the fan service, and even then the fan service is a mere window dressing that is disappointingly boring and doesn't really do as much as it could have done. Ultimately, I give the game a 6 out of 10.